afternoon, everybody. I'm here from the General Register Office, and today we're going to give you a little information on the background of the General Register Office and also on our new Family History website. My name is Emma, and with me is Catherine. We'd like to take this opportunity to thank the Public Records Office for having us along today. Okay, so we'll start. The General Register Office's primary function is to administer the marriage laws and to provide a civil registration system for births, deaths, marriages, civil partnerships and adoptions. This presentation will last about 20-25 minutes and we'll take any questions that you have at the end. We have some um, leaflets with us on the table. If you want to help yourselves at the end, you'll get our website address and that sort of thing off the leaflets. So, in 1538, Thomas Cromwell, Henry VIII's Chancellor, introduced a system whereby the clergy of the established church were required to keep registers of all baptisms, weddings and funerals at which they officiated. This system never attained the high standards that they sought, so there was a number of attempts over the years to make registration comprehensive and compulsory, but it was not until 1836 that legislation was introduced um, creating a civil registration system in England and Wales. The government made its intentions clear that this was to be extended to Ireland. Nevertheless, it was some nine years until this was to happen. In 1845, registration of non-Roman Catholic marriages was introduced in Ireland. The Roman Catholic Church was concerned that this requirement would detract from the religious nature of the ceremony. Therefore, that's the reason that there's no Roman Catholic marriages registered at this time. In 1854, Parliament passed an act to provide for the better registration of births, deaths and marriages in Scotland. This transferred the responsibility from church to state and put a statutory obligation on individuals to register vital events. In 1864, registrations for births, deaths and marriages, it's all marriages, was introduced in Ireland. You'll see on screen the first death that was registered in what is now Northern Ireland. This was of a Mary Rourke, and she was aged 57. On this she was unmarried, so her occupation appears on this. Um, if she had been married, it would have appeared as occupation of... John Smith, for example. <coughs> it's as late as 2012 when legislation was changed to include the occupation of a married woman instead of putting her husband's name and occupation there. The original Registration Act placed a requirement <coughs> on the General Register Office to supply a sufficient number of iron boxes to hold the register books. These had to be stored in a dry and secure part of the Registrar General's House for Dwelling Office. Every such box was to be furnished with a lock and two keys, one for the Registrar and the other for the Superintendent Registrar. A waterproof bag was part of the Registrar's stock, as was a special registration ink that was required to put the entries in the register. The ink could not be left uncorked and was not to be diluted, as this would affect the quality of the registration. If the Registrar found the ink to be not of a good colour, he was to report the this to the Registrar General. These provisions, sorry, these provisions were designed to prevent any illegal tampering with the records. And on screen you'll see an example of an advert for the ink, the ink bottles that was taken from the Henderson Gazette. So today we recognise the importance of the good quality ink, as when it's not adhered to, this means that the registrations are faint and are not easily read. As you've seen in Mary Rourke's death entry, it was quite clear. The act was taken very seriously. However, in some cases it was not adhered to, meaning that entries are faint and in some cases illegible. As in this one on the screen. This is a marriage entry that's from 1885. However, when you can see, I'm not sure if any of you can see in the top corner, it actually looks as if it reads 1855. This makes it very hard for us to decipher and to put on our indexes.
The registration functions were placed with the Ministry of Finance in 1921 and later assigned on the 8th of April 1922 to Leonard Albert Bullwinkle, who was the first person to hold the post of the Registrar General in Northern Ireland. The, Gen the Re General Register Office for Northern Ireland was established and based at 4 Murray Street in Belfast. In 1931, the Register of Adopted Children was introduced, and in 1973, the reform of local government saw changes and the 26 district councils became the registration authorities for their areas. <coughs> Before modernisation, legislation always permitted members of the public to search the indexes. This could be done in the local district offices and the general register office. To enable them to do this, they would have needed to know the exact date as they would have needed to search through the large books which needed to be retrieved from these dusty racks as you'll see in the picture. <coughs> in 2001, the General Register Office opened a search room allowing members of the public to search the indexes. Members of staff were available to provide full information from the actual registration. In May 2005, GRO introduced a new computer system for the registration of life events. And from 2009 to 2011, 8.6 million non-computerized records from 1845 were digitized and integrated onto this system, allowing GRO to produce certificates more effectively and in a shorter time scale. This involved the scanning of the old paper registers, deciphering the handwriting and reaping the benefits of the good quality ink. <coughs> In March 2014, GRO launched the new Family History website, allowing the public to search historical records online. The website has also been introduced into our public search room. So you can search in the public search room from 1845 till present <coughs> date and on the website is historic records. So to give you a little bit of information on the website, this is what the London page looks like. The address is available on all our handouts over on the table. To use the site you need to register for an account. This will enable you to search our records for what is now Northern Ireland. The historical records are births over 100 years, deaths over 50 years ago, and marriages over 75 years ago. These time scales were agreed by the Northern Ireland Assembly in 2012. From the landing page, you will be directed to this screen where you can register for an account and carry out your own family history research. You can use the free search that's on the screen. Um, it does just return the amount of registrations for the period. It doesn't give you any further information. Once you've registered for an account, you need to buy at least one credit, which costs 40p. Once you've bought that credit, you can search the basic indexes. Okay. To give you an idea of how the system works, we'll look at the life events of Thomas Andrews, the naval architect and director for Harland and Wolfe. He's best known for the design of the Titanic. So we'll start with births. And this screen shows you the information that you need to search for an entry. On the screen, I've entered the surname Andrews and the year 1873. You can put more information in if you need it. The system will let you search for a five year period of time, for example 1900 to 1904, as this is inclusive. To narrow your search down, obviously the more information you enter, the less results that are going to be returned. Once you've entered your search criteria, the results will be shown as on screen. The basic search is free, so this is totally free and will not cost you any credits. <coughs> so for this search, all children born with the surname Andrews between 1873 and 1874, sorry, 
1874, are returned. As I already know that um, Thomas Andrews' mother's name was Perry, I would assume the one that's highlighted here on the screen, if you can see it, <coughs> is the correct one. To make sure, I would then be able to go ahead and use the enhanced or the full buttons over on the far side. In this case, Thomas was not given a forename, <coughs> therefore it's returned as not captured. It was common for children to be registered without a forename. <coughs> so take this into consideration when you're carrying out your own research. <coughs> so this screen shows you the enhanced search results for the birth of Thomas Andrews. So it gives you extra information as the father and mother's name, <coughs> including the mother's maiden name, is there. <coughs> to view this enhanced record, it costs you one credit, which is 40p. From here you can search further and go into the full, which costs a further five credits. You can jump from the basic to the full as well if you want to, bypassing the enhanced <coughs> index. <coughs> So the full results, search results are shown the scanned image with the text below. The image is the actual birth entry which shows father's residence. In some cases this could be a townland or it could be the name of a house um, or it could be a street name. The father's occupation and the insignature of the informants also there. As I mentioned Thomas was not given a forename. So you'll see on screen that he's actually entered as a dash. The last column that you'll see on the screen here is used for baptismal names. So if the child was later baptised and the parents informed GRO, that would be in the last column. Also up to 1973, a child was not actually given a surname. As you'll see in the entry, it's only a forename. That was taken from either the mother or the father. Legislation was changed in 1973 to include a name, a surname for the child. To search for Thomas Andrews' marriage entry, I've entered his name and surname with the years 1908 to 1909. You can search using either bride or groom. There's also little question mark symbols beside some of the boxes, which gives you information on what's there. The marriage search results will be returned showing you the name of the person that you searched, along with their partner's surname, the date of marriage and the registration district. From this search, only one entry has been returned and you'll see that Thomas' wife's maiden name was Barber. I skipped the enhanced view for this search and went straight to the full view. This entry shows the bride and groom's names and ages at time of marriage, which in this case is captured as full, which just means that they were over 21. In other cases you'll see minor, which is under 21. On registrations after 2004, the date of birth is captured. It also shows their condition as bachelor and spinster. The legislation was changed in 2004 to change the title of this column from condition to marital status, showing the person as single, divorced or widowed, etc. Further information that's displayed is their residence at time of marriage, occupation, and their father's name and occupation. As the General Register Office only holds life events that occurred in Northern Ireland, we do not have the death of Thomas Andrews. Therefore, to show you what a death entry looks like, we have chosen a John Kelly. In order to search for John Kelly's death, I've entered the surname as Kelly 
and his initial is J. And I've just changed this drop down from equals to begins with. And that means you can put in one character for a forename. And I think it's three for a surname. So there's three different options in that drop down. There's equals, begins with, and variants. The equals will return everything exactly as entered. The begins with, obviously if you just enter the one letter, the J, it will return all names beginning with J. The variants option has yet to be fully developed, therefore I would advise you not to use it. The death results are shown on screen providing information such as name, date of death and age if captured. For a child under one, it usually is displayed as dashes. The John Kelly we're going to look at is this one here that's age 19. The death entry of John Kelly shows his date of death, place of death, condition and age at time of death. It also shows his occupation which is recorded as catch boy in shipyard and his cause of death as accidentally fell from ship 401 while at work at Queen's Island, 23rd of June 1910, shock following injuries. On checking the shipping register, ship 401 was actually the Titanic. He was one of eight people to be to die while the Titanic was being built. Mr. Kelly's death was referred to the coroner, and as an inquest was held, no informant is recorded. This can be the case with some deaths, although other registrations have an informant, which also gives you an idea if you've got the right person or not. If you're looking for registrations that do not fall into the historic time scales, as I explained earlier, births over 100 years, deaths over 50 years, and marriages over 75 years ago, you can visit our public search room. It's in Oxford House, where all life events are registered, that are registered, are available from 1845 to present day for you to search. There's 15 spaces available each day. We're open Monday to Friday. The cost for using the public search room is seven pounds. You do still need to register as you would at home and buy credits. Um, the office opens at half nine and closes at four. If you are wanting to use the public search room, I would advise you to book before you travel. Would anybody like to ask anything?